Ahoy there, mateys, and welcome back to some Warhammer Fantasy lore. In today's second episode on the Imperial Navy, we're gonna delve deeper into the workings of the organization. That includes their job, their actual organization, their recruitment practices, and more. I am your host, Captain GDN, for today, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Imperial Navy is an essential part of the Empire's military. Not only are they responsible for defending the Empire coasts and trade routes, but they also transport the state armies and the local militias wherever they need to go, acting as a force multiplier and allowing for the rapid redeployment of the Empire troops. Furthermore, the Navy is used to blockade enemy ports, escort merchant convoys, explore distant lands, transport dignitaries, and capture foreign vessels. That last one actually being one of the most lucrative businesses in the old world. No matter the skills or capabilities of an individual, there will always be a place for them in the Imperial Navy. And it demands little in return other than hard work, an adventurous nature, and an affinity for grog. The stated goals of the Imperial Navy are threefold. First, it protects the coasts, the rivers and the trade routes, the ports and shores of the Empire. Secondly, it investigates foreign vessels in Imperial waters. Lastly, it provides transportation for men and equipment to project the power of the Emperor wherever it is deemed necessary. Of course, this is a simplification of the Imperial Navy's duty, especially as the Northern Fleet swears to the Grand Baron Gausser of Nordland, not to the Emperor. The Navy's motivation is equally simple. It is in the service of the Elector Count and it is paid to do a job. Again, this simplifies a rather complex situation. For example, many young nobles join the Navy in the hope of making a fortune with spoils and prizes, not out of any sense of loyalty to the Empire or for meager pay. But it is all the motivation a real seaman is supposed to need. The Navy works very closely with the Reichland and Northern state armies, and has a very good relationship with the colonels of many of the regiments of these great provinces. However, the most strident supporters of the Imperial Navy are not in fact the nobility or the armies, but the merchants. The warships ensure relatively safe passage for merchant vessels along the trade routes, and this translates into a lot of reduction in the lost revenue to pirates. In fact, over the last couple of decades, especially Dietershaven, Sieverhof, Stilstand, and Salkalten have prospered greatly due to the increased protection and increased trading activity, and all that thanks to the presence of the Northern Fleet. As one would expect out of any fighting force, the Imperial Navy also has a lot of enemies. Firstly, the navies and merchant navies of the other Old World countries are the ones who pose the greatest problem. But, in turn, the Imperial Navy also poses a big problem for them. So, whether it be the longships of the Norse Reavers, the dragonships of the Elves, the crude hulks of the Greenskins, or the galleons of the Tylians, the Imperial Navy will face them all, and they will face the Imperial Navy in turn. Pirates are also a perpetual problem, and one that is a lot more difficult to prevent than an enemy armada. The pirates of Stradrober Bay in Ostland are one of the most notorious groups, acting on the trade routes to Erengrad and are known to sink any captured vessel. Lastly, the navy also has to deal with monsters out of the deep. As mentioned in the previous episode as well, the navy is split into two great elements. The first fleet, based in Reichland, and the second fleet, based in Nordland. To the north, this newer, more modern fleet operates out of Dietershaven in Nordland. It is not the biggest fleet in the old world, but it is well trained and well equipped. To the south, the Imperial First Fleet operates out of the Reichsport. This is by far the bigger of the two fleets, but the majority of its vessels barely ever see the actual sea, because the tolls of Marienburg for war vessels are very expensive and so they are usually seen patrolling the rivers instead. The geographical and ideological differences between the two fleets could not be any bigger, 
The Nordlanders view the Racklander fleet as a mess of foppish nobility playing at ships, with drunken sailors on old tatty vessels, and have no respect for them at all. In turn, the Racklanders see the Nordlanders as barely civilized upstarts, with little regard for tradition or sound military tactics, and they show no respect. To say that they dislike one another would be to seriously underestimate the problem. The Imperial Navy does employ all kinds of folk. At sea, the ships are effectively large communities, with some boasting a complement of more than a thousand souls. And supporting these numbers requires a broad array of skills from all walks of life. Indeed, many ship rosters read like a cross-section of the Empire itself. Nobles and Magisters, Priests and Craftsmen, Soldiers and Servants, and of course, the Seamen. Everyone is present, and everyone is required. This is mirrored by the Navy's shore-based establishments as well. The naval missions employ entertainers, innkeepers, servants, craftsmen, and more. The Admiralty employs a wide array of staff to administer the Navy, and supports it with heralds, servants, stewards, scholars, scribes, and more. Lastly, there are the shipyards, the quays, the warehouses, and many others. The Navy overall is a massive employer, and it is always recruiting. The Imperial Navy is also redolent with different means of communication. The main methods are flags and pennants and whistle blasts. However, many more techniques also exist, especially since the arrival of the Imperial engineers aboard the vessels. Flags and pennants are the most popular method of long-distance communication. 26 square flags are used to represent letters, and 10 triangular pennants are used to represent numbers. Beyond signifying numbers and letters, each flag, or combination of flags, also has a predetermined meaning. The Northern Fleet also uses a hand flag semaphore system to communicate messages. Action by holding an O flag in each hand and positioning the flag in a succession of predetermined moves, each of which represents a number, a letter, or short code. Heraldic flags, also called ensigns by the Navy, are also used to provide information about the vessel and the occupants. The ensign flows usually details which province the ship is from, whom it represents, and whether there is a sea lord or an admiral aboard. Thus, the admiral's ship is commonly referred to as the flagship, for it flies his heraldic ensign. Where flags are used to communicate at a distance, whistles are used to communicate at shorter range. All the officers, from the Sea Lord down to the lowest petty officer, are given a whistle as a symbol of their authority. Because many of the duties performed on a warship require good rhythm and timing, the boatswain and the coxswains use whistles to keep time, with those falling out of time typically receiving a great lashing. Furthermore, different combinations of tones and blasts can be used to alert seamen of anything from a captain arriving on a bridge to a warning to all quarters to be ready for engagement. Contrary to the popular belief of press gangers clubbing their way through the poor quarters of Aldorf, the Imperial Navy Marines do not usually do such things. By Imperial Maritime Law, a press gang man must be of, and I quote, seafaring habits and between the ages of 15 and 50. Of course, sometimes the marines make mistakes, and a butcher or a rat catcher will find himself aboard a vessel heading out to sea, but by that time it is far too late. In truth, most of a typical ship complement is made up of volunteers, drawn to the navy by the promise of regular pay and their own spirit of adventure. As such, the bulk of the imperial navy is comprised of men between the ages of 18 and 30. The greatest responsibility for any naval man is to simply do his job. For some, that involves putting out to sea for months at a time. For others, it involves working in a naval support network, maybe as an innkeeper, a shipwright, a cloth maker, and even a lawyer. For a select few, it may involve even working undercover, seeking to further the Navy's goals by spying on the enemy and gathering information. Whatever the job may be, it still needs to be done and that is all. For those who manage to do their job, there are benefits. Primary among these is the opportunity to get a fresh start, access to naval missions, and most importantly, plunder. Firstly, all new recruits are cleaned, de-loused, and clothed, 
and after they sign their contract of employment, they are guaranteed a wage. Furthermore, they get fed, a significant draw for out-of-work men with little chance of employment on land. There is also a network of naval missions down the length of the River Reich, which provides cheap food, bedding, and entertainment for the serving seamen. The missions are quite popular, for many seamen appreciate the cheap alcohol and good music. However, the greatest benefits open to a serving member of the navy is of course plunder. Any ship legally captured can be sold, along with all its contents, upon returning to port. The money earned is supposed to be split among the crew and the Imperial Navy Admiralty, with the Admiralty taking one-eighth, the captain of the capturing vessel taking a quarter, the master and the lieutenants, the warrant officers and petty officers each take one-eighth, and what is left is split among the seamen and the marines. So great is the potential hole here that in the three years the Unschrocken plied Bretonian waters in the early 2500s, it managed to capture no less than 53 vessels as prizes, earning every crewman almost 20 years of wage on top of their usual pay. The captain, one Lord Riken von Telland, retired at the young age of 26, and now owns three palaces in Aldorf, one in Nuln, and estates in Telebeckland as well. Of course, if a ship is illegally captured, then the full brunt of the cost is borne by the captain, a result which can easily turn a man into a pauper quicker than one can say, walk the plank. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Imperial Navy and some of its more unique practices in Warhammer Fantasy for today. Once again, I too find myself surprised by the amount of lore existing on this rather obscure topic that is the Empire Fleet. This series will also continue with at least one more video on the ranks in the Navy and the various jobs available on a ship. Other than that, I also want to make a video on the types of ships that the Empire uses, as there is actually quite a few. Not certain if I can make a whole video just around that, but I'll be happy to try. What about you though? What are your thoughts on the Imperial Navy and the aspects we described today? As always, I look forward to reading them in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching to the end, and the blessings of Sigmar be upon you.